Good morning. I'd like for you to open up your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 22. We're going to be taking the basis of our lesson from this, this passage this morning. 1 Kings chapter 22. I'll give you a little bit of background about 1 Kings 22. Uh, this is in the period of Old Testament history in which the prophet Elijah was living. And Elijah... Uh, prophesied against the wicked king Ahab. Ahab was king of Israel and he was one of the most wicked kings in their history. But this particular episode that we're going to read about in chapter 22 of First Kings does not deal with Elijah and Ahab. It deals with another prophet of the Lord and his dealings with Ahab. That prophet's name was Micaiah. And so I'd like for us to read starting with verse 1. Of 1 Kings 22. It says, For three years Israel and Syria continued without war. But in the third year Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said to his servants, Do you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and we keep quiet and do not take it out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said to Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to battle at Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, that would be Ahab, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Inquire first for the word of the Lord. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about four hundred men, and said to them, Shall I go to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah the son of Imlah, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, Bring quickly Micaiah the son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king of Judah were sitting on their thrones arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. And Zedekiah the son of Shaneah made for himself horns of iron and said, Thus says the Lord, with these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, Go up and try him. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Shaneah, came near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, How did the Spirit of the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Behold, you shall see on that day when you go into an inner chamber to hide yourself. And the king of Israel said, Seize Micaiah and take him back to Amnon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him meager rations of 
bread, bread and water until I come in peace. And Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, hear all you peoples. I want you to put yourself in Micaiah's shoes. Can you imagine the amount of courage that it would have taken for this man to basically stand alone in front of the king of Israel, the most powerful man in the nation, the man who had the authority and the power to put him to death, to take away his freedom, and speak truth to power. Can you imagine the courage it must have taken for Micaiah to not join in with all the other prophets who were lying and telling that king what he wanted to hear, but rather to speak truth to him, even though it, he knew that it would cost him at the very least his freedom and most likely his life. This man is one of the most courageous individuals that you will read about in the entire Bible. And what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is the courage that Micaiah had and the courage that God wants us to have as Christians. Our theme for this year is pressing on towards the goal, what Paul said in Philippians 3. Christians, we cannot press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus without courage. It is impossible, impossible to live the Christian life without courage. And when I say courage, this is what I mean. The word courage means to be bold or confident. It is the opposite of fear. Now fear, in a certain way, fear is a good, good thing. Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11, and talking about all those men and women of faith in the Old Testament, that Hebrews 11 verse 7 says that they had godly fear. They had great reverence for God. They had great respect for God. That's what the fear of the Lord's referring to. That kind of fear is a good thing. But at the same time, the Bible also speaks of fear when it comes to being cowardly or timid. You know, when I was a boy, one song that we would sing, and, and it, we were kind of immature to sing it, but one song that we would sing would kind of be focused on Revelation 21, verse 8. In Revelation 21, verse 8, one of the things that the song focused on, and I think most people focus on when they read that passage, is how there's this great list of sins, and liars are at the very end of the list. And it says that those who commit these sins they will have their portion in hell, the lake which burns with fire and sulfur. And when I was a boy, we would always focus on the last sin of the list, which was liars. But if you look at the first sin that's on the list, if you look at that verse in the Bible, the very first sin on the list is the cowardly. God does not want us to be cowardly. Paul said in 2 Timothy, that God has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity. God wants us to have courage. Paul told us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. It takes courage to stand. It takes courage to make the right choice. It takes courage to do what Micaiah did, to make a stand for truth, to make a stand for God even when no one else is doing it. There are many things that we will encounter in our lives as Christians that will require courage. It takes courage to speak boldly. If you go to Ephesians chapter 6 and you look at verses 18 through 20, you'll see that Paul asked Christians to pray for him. And one of the things that he asked Christians to pray about when it came to him was that so that I may speak boldly, that I may declare the gospel boldly as I ought to speak. Notice he wanted them to pray that he could have courage, that he would be able to preach the gospel with courage. And he says, as I ought to speak. 
as I ought to speak. God wants you to share the gospel with other people, and he wants you to do so with courage. It takes courage to speak the truth. You read the New Testament, and you will see how people who proclaim the gospel were described. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Peter and John are arrested for preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. They, they stand before the same people who condemned Jesus to death not that long before, the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin are amazed because it says in Acts 4, verse 13, that they saw the boldness of Peter and John. These men were being persecuted. These men were risking their freedom and their lives, but they still had courage to preach the truth. In that same chapter, Acts chapter 4, you look at verse 29, the early Christians prayed for courage. They asked God, now Lord, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And if you look at verse 31, God granted their prayer. Luke says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God in boldness. And then later in chapter 5, the apostles are commanded by the Sanhedrin to never again preach about Jesus of Nazareth. And then they're released from jail. And what did they do? What was the first thing that they did? You look at verse 31 of Acts chapter 5. It says that, or excuse me, verse 42 of Acts chapter 5. It says, in every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. It takes courage to do that. How many of us are speaking boldly, not caring about the consequences as long as we speak the truth in love? How many of us have courage to tell others about Jesus knowing that it might offend them? That's what the church needs. That's what Christians need. We need courage to do that. It takes courage to do something else as well. It takes courage to say no when everyone else is saying yes. The Christian life will always be in the minority, brethren. If you want to live for God, if you want to do what God would have you to do in every area of your life, you will always be in the minority. You remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14? The way that leads to death, it's wide and it's easy and many go by it, but the way that leads to life is narrow and hard and few there are which find it. What's Jesus telling us? The majority will not be saved. And that means that if you are going to be a faithful Christian, you will always be in the minority. It takes courage to be in the minority. Moses said in Exodus 23, verse 2, you shall not fall in with the many to do evil. It takes courage to stand against the many, to refuse to do the evil that everyone else is doing. It takes courage to be at work and be invited to the Christmas party or maybe be invited by your boss to a restaurant to discuss a promotion and everyone else at the party or at the restaurant, everyone else is ordering wine, ordering beer, ordering a daiquiri or ordering martini and yet you're the only one who says no thank you and chooses water or a soft drink instead. It takes courage to do that. It takes courage to be young, a young Christian these days when everyone else, all of your friends, are embracing sexual immorality. It takes courage to say, no, I, I am going to save myself for marriage and risk the ridicule and the mockery that comes from that. It takes courage to be able to say with love and kindness and yet also with courage and firmness, no, no, I don't believe that 
homosexuality is okay. I don't believe that transgenderism is okay. I, I think that those things are wrong. And I refuse to be a part of them. I refuse to condone them. Everyone else is doing that, but you will not. You risk mockery. You risk ostracism. The loss of friends. But are you going to risk all that and stand for what is right anyway? You won't be able to. Unless. Unless. You have courage. It takes courage. To say no when everyone else is saying yes. You want to resist the pressures of the world. You want to remain loyal to Christ. You want to stand up for Christ's church when everyone else is attacking plain Bible teaching. Oh, you're a member of the church of Christ. That, that's just a cult. They don't, they're weird over there. They don't believe in music. They think they're the only ones going to heaven. You want to be a part of that? And you say, yes, I do, because it's the church I read about in the Bible. And I want to be a part of that church. It takes courage to say that. It takes courage to say no when everyone else is saying yes. It also takes courage to face criticism and persecution. I want you to open up your Bibles to Jeremiah in the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20. Now, Jeremiah is a prophet who had grown used to the cold stares and the angry frowns. He had grown used to the contempt and the open hatred from his fellow countrymen because the whole nation was involved in gross immorality and paganism, and he was one of the very few who stood for God. And yet, Jeremiah wasn't a superman. Jeremiah was human, and we're going to see this in chapter 20. Let's start with verse 1. It says, Now Pasher the priest, the son of Emur, who was chief officer in the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things. Then Pasher beat Jeremiah the prophet and put him in the stocks that were in the upper Benjamin gate of the house of the Lord. So here you have Jeremiah, a prophet, and he is preaching the truth, and you have a priest. You have a priest whom you would think would also be wanting to stand for God. And yet, what does this priest do? This priest beats Jeremiah and puts him in the stocks. Jeremiah was truly alone, wasn't he? If you keep reading, starting with verse 3, going through verse 6, he's released from the stocks, and then he has a pretty severe prophecy of condemnation that he gives to that priest. But then I want us to read, starting with verse 7. You see, the constant persecution, the constant criticism, it wore Jeremiah down. He was human. There was only so much that he thought he could take. Look at verse 7. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. There's a point that Jeremiah was so worn down that he was so ready to give up that he was even blaming God. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. I've had it. I'm, I'm not going to preach the truth anymore. I'm not going to preach the word of God anymore. It's got me nothing but sorrow. And it's got me nothing but contempt and reproach. I can't take it anymore. I'm not going to do it. And yet, and yet, read the next verse. Read verse 9. He went on to say, if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. I'm ready to quit. I don't want to do this anymore, but I realize that I can't go down that road. I have to keep speaking the truth. I have to. There's a part of me that wants to stop. There's a part of me that's had enough, but I cannot get in. I'm going to keep on doing what God wants me to do. 
do you realize how much courage it takes to do that? It takes courage to keep on standing for what is right even when you're being derided and mocked and hurt because of it. And it takes courage to stand alone for what is right, just as it was with Micaiah. There are times when others will stand with us and encourage us, but there are going to be times when we are by ourselves. And when we are by ourselves, especially in those times, it will take courage to stand for what is right. Again, if we are going to stand against the schemes of the devil, it takes courage. If we are going to do what Paul told us to do, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 11, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, it's going to take courage. Courage is one of the greatest needs of our time. If you are going to live righteously, Christian, if you are going to teach the truth, know this, you will endure slander, you will endure ridicule, you will endure persecution, there is no way to stand for God without making enemies. Jesus was sinless. He was the greatest man who ever lived. He was the perfect, the one perfect human being who ever lived. And yet even Jesus had enemies and those enemies killed him because he spoke the truth. There's a preacher who used to be a professor of Bible at Harding University. His name's Jimmy Allen. And here's what he said. He said, if we live and die without ever having made adversaries, many times we will have allowed the banner of Emmanuel to be dragged through the dust without raising a voice in its defense. That is very true. If you want to live for what is right, People will be upset with you. People will be displeased with you. Knowing that, and still, in spite of it, choosing to do what is right requires courage. You remember Joshua? He took a stand for God. Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord, Joshua 24, verse 15. No matter what others chose to do, Joshua chose to do what was right. He had the courage of his convictions. And we must be the same. We must be the same. Let us stand and let us sing.